Well, welcome to the series on the return. This is part nine. Uh, I'm not entitling them and according to their subject. I could entitle this one The Antichrist, um, but and I'm just going part one, part two, going through part nine. I've already started writing part 10. But before we get on to The Antichrist, I do sometimes, I have to confess, get a little concerned when people get more caught up or more interested in the study of The Antichrist and The Mark of the Beast than they get caught up in the study of Jesus, right? The book of Revelation is all about the revelation of Jesus. And so, you know, just as before we begin, we talked about the temple last week in relation to the possibility of another temple, the third temple being built on the Jewish Mount, uh, sorry, on the Temple Mount. And uh, you may recall Solomon's temple was built there in 957 BC. We remember um, David's tabernacle was there, a replacement of, of course, Moses' tabernacle. And you can look at the legacy series, learn all about it, what it means to us today. And uh, David's tabernacle was built on Mount Zion, on this, on this temple mount. And then Solomon built this beautiful grand temple to the Lord. It was built in 957 BC. It was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. I went over this last week in 587 BC on the 9th of Abe. Remember the 9th of Abe. A lot of bad things happened to the Jewish nation on that time. Both temples were destroyed. It was also the date that the 12 spies came back, 10 of them with a negative report in 1313 BC. You may remember that. The Battle of Beta was lost on the 9th of Abe in 135 AD. The Jews were expelled from England on the 9th of Abe on 1290 AD. And they were expelled from Spain again on the 9th of Abe. Not a, bad, not a good day for them in 1492. So Tisha Bahave is the full name of it, and I didn't pronounce it right, forgive me. But it's the 11th month of the civil calendar and the fifth month of the ecclesiastical calendar. That's the Hebrew calendar I'm talking about. Basically, in our Jogarian calendar, July, August. So Herod's temple was built in 20 BC, destroyed by Titus, I did tell you, in 70 AD. Jesus spoke about it. He predicted it and uh, prophesied about it on the 9th of Abe as well. Now, what I didn't mention is the temple that was approved by Cyrus, by King Cyrus. King Cyrus was a Persian king who was named 150 to 200 years before he was born. God named him. He is named by God in prophecy that he would uh, restore Israel. Isaiah 44 verse 28. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He, this is before Cyrus was born. Who says of Cyrus, he, shall before, he, he is my shepherd. He shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built. And to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, that you may know that I am the Lord who call you by name and the God of Israel. Remember, I've gone through the people that were named in Scripture, like John the Baptist before they were born. Jesus, another one, of course. And we went through some of the uh, Old Testament saints as well. There's a, a number of them, I think seven, if I recall right. But who call you by name and the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect's sake, I've even called you by name. God's emphasizing it. I've named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, there is none other. This is an amazing prophecy. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to the setting, there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is none other. And so in the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 1, and you're following me. Now in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, uh, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout his kingdom, also putting it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. That's an incredible fulfillment of the prophecy out of Isaiah. And so that was completed in 515 BC. It wasn't as grand as Solomon's temple, and those who remember Remembered, you know, they wept over it. Alexander the Great, by the way, nearly desecrated this temple in 332 BC because the Jewish people would not recognize the deification of Alexandra. Alexander, interesting, like a, a false antichrist, he died at the same age as Jesus. He died as he wept uh, that, you know, he had nothing else to conquer. Um, they say he died of a venereal disease, but, you know, but, you know, who knows. But they, there were a number of other sieges over the centuries. 
uh, and I don't pronounce his names right, and forgive me for that, but Antichrist, he erected a statue of Zeus in the temple, and the Hellenic priest began to sacrifice pigs in the temple. During the Roman e era, Pompeii entered and therefore desecrated the Holies of Holies in 63 BC, but left the temple intact. In 54 BC, Crassus looted the temple treasury. Around 20 BC, the building, this building that was built by Cyrus, or commissioned by Cyrus, I should say, was renovated and expanded by Herod the Great, hence known as Herod's temple. And this was the temple that was there when Jesus walked the earth. We saw photos of it last week. As mentioned, this temple was destroyed on the 9th of April by the Roman Titus in 70 AD. Let's read Daniel chapter 12, verse 5. And I know when we talk about last days, some of this stuff is hard to follow, but I hope you do. And I hope you go back over it and, and follow. Uh, Daniel 12, verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on the riverbank and the other on the riverbank. And one man said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these things wonders be? Now this is Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, the last chapter. Daniel's been prophesying about the last days, prophesying about what's going to happen. He comes right to the end. How? And this guy, he's saying, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard a man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, obviously angelic and he held up his right hand and by his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it should be a time times and half a time three and a half years when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered all these things shall be finished verse 11 and from the time that the continual burnt offering shall be taken away right temples destroyed and the abomination that maketh it desolate set up there shall be look at it 1,290 days, 1,290, 1,290. The previous time, time times and half a time, 42 months is 1,260. Now we've got 1,290. The mosque was built on the Temple Mount, finished in 692 AD. Now dates are interesting. But from the time of Nebuchadnezzar's first invasion of Jerusalem, which is 605, 606 BC, you count 1,290 days, as years, because that's what you do in relation to Daniel, 70 weeks and so forth, days as years. We went over that last year, how God said for 40 days of the, of the spies going into the land of Israel, they'll wander for 40 years and so forth. You count uh, 1290 years from that date, you pretty much come to 685, 686 AD, which is the start of the construction of the Dome of the Ross Mosque on that Temple Mount. Daniel said to count 1290 from the, when the daily sacrifice was taken away. And so that invasion, Nebuchadnezzar, obviously stopped the sacrifice. Counting 1290 from the year the second invasion took place from 597 to 99 BC, you come to 692, 693 AD. That was the year the Dome of the Rock was completed. If you count 1260 from the midpoint of the Ross con Mosque construction, in 688, you arrive at 1948, the start of the fig tree generation. And so from the midpoint of the mosque, when the mosque was being constructed, back in the 600s, you come, 1260 years later, you come to 1948, the year the fig tree uh, began to bloom. Daniel chapter 12, verse 8. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall the end of these things? When, what shall be the end of these things? He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be uh, purified, made white, refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. I hope we're understanding today. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, look at it now, there shall be 1,290 days. Then he says in verse 12, blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Talking about life after death, the resurrection and so forth. So now you've got 1,335 days mentioned in verse 12. You've got 1,290 days mentioned in verse 11. Time times half a time in, uh, mentioned in verse 7. And as I said, that's 1,260 days, 42 months. And that you can get that from Revelation 11, 12, 12, 6, 
and 13.6. It's mentioned three times as 1,260. Now, you've got to be very careful because you can make numbers say a lot of things and a lot of things you want, right? But please remember, and there's been many last day prophecies. And we do see today uh, that many things have been fulfilled in the past. There's been many kingdoms and coming and goings of rulers that have already fulfilled a lot of Scripture. And sometimes Scripture's got two applications, one for us today and one for the past. I mean, take Nero, for example. Nero, who ruled as Caesar at the time when John was on the island of Patmos, he was labelled and certainly was an antichrist. He persecuted Christians like nobody else. He would deep dip them in wax, light them as candles. He'd bury them in the foot and race chariots around on their heads, slice their heads off. He was a terrible man. And so he blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome when he lit it himself. Now the 10 emperors till the time of Constantine, uh, when Jesus talked about the 10 days of testing, these were the 10, they were all antichrists, persecuted the church tremendously. There's a name, the names uh, list comes up on the screen and you can take a photograph. I'm not going to read them all through, uh, but these people lived up until 300 and they persecuted the church. First John 2.18 states there are many antichrists, right? Look at verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour. Here's here, this is the last hour, 2,000 years ago. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know this is the last hour. So when you study the Old Testament, the rulers of Persia, Greece, Asia, Babylon, kings, and of course boundaries have changed. Nations have been renamed as well. And so the thing is, is that the kings and the times of scriptures are incredible. No two ways about it because they've got multiple fulfillment. When you study it and you study uh, some of this history, like it can get quite complicated unless you're a history buff, but it's so incredible. And kingdoms being raised and kingdoms being lowered. And I don't want to confound you with science. You need to do your own research and own diligent research. But one has got multiple fulfillments and yet they also speak of our day, which of course, this is what we're interested in, right? Not too many of are interested in what happened, you know, in 300 BC or 500 AD or whatever, uh, unless you're a history buff or a Bible scholar. But some numbers, just to give you some thoughts. Scripturally, from the abomination of the Jewish people when their temple on the Temple Mount was destroyed, when they could no longer sacrifice there, and that's what Daniel was talking about, when other gods were set up there, and I've mentioned about the pigs being slaughtered, you know about pigs in Israel, both destruction of the temples, they were desecrated. Remember verse 12 of Daniel 12, blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Well, 1,335 days, we count these as years when we do 70 uh, Daniel 70 weeks as I, I mentioned and in breaking up Daniel 70 weeks which he does and we'll talk about it it predicts the first coming and the second coming of Christ now we want to look at some things but one of the things that the Antichrist does it talks about in scripture and I'll give you the scripture that he changes the times the calendar alters the seasons hence to hide the truth from the, of the Scriptures revealing the timing of Christ's comings. But in counting 1,335 from the beginning of the construction of the Dome of Rock, 686 AD, you actually come to year 2021. Now that can sound pretty spooky, pretty scary, but counting 1,335, which is in Daniel chapter 12, uh, from the, the construction of the Dome of the Rock in 686, you come to 2021. Counting 1,335 from the completion of the Dome of the Rock in 692, you come to 2027. Now, the Dome of the Rock is not the only thing that has stood on the Temple Mount since the late 7th century. Most of you will know, and I've been there, and we'll endeavour to get something on the screen for you, but you've seen the photo of the Temple Mount. You've got the al Qasa, and I'm not pronouncing that right, so please forgive me. I certainly don't mean to offend anybody. I just have problems with words, but A-L-A-Q-S-A -A -A mosque. If I hear somebody say it, I can say it. I'm like a parrot, but to come up with it myself, I have difficulty. Um, but this is actually holier than the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock is more spectacular from the outside. Um, but this, that has stood there as well. And that was consecrated by Caliphate Omar in 693 AD, 693 AD. These two mosques combine what is known for the Muslims as a noble sanctuary. It's the third holiest site in Islam. 
Now, if you count 1,335 years from 693 AD, when this mosque was consecrated, we come to 2028. 2028, you come back seven years for tribulation, 2021. Am I saying this is a big year? Well, it could be a big year. It's not over yet, but I don't want to be the boy crying wolf either. People have, people have spoken about it before and people are wrong. That's why a lot of pastors don't want to be talking about it today because they don't want to be wrong. And uh, I'm not saying that this emphatically is. I'm just saying this is interesting. I think you'll find it interesting, but enough to say, I'm not saying that this is a year or 2028 is a year because the thing is, is 1940, is that when Jesus is that the year that Jesus was talking about that that generation shall not pass away uh, when the fig tree blossoms most scholars would say that happened in 1948 Israel became a nation that Israel is a fig tree and it began to blossom and of course we talked about a generation being 70 to 80 years 80 years that generation will not pass away so from 1948 80 years the outer limit is 2028 so seven year tribulation back to 2021. Think about this. This is just a nice thought for you. Jesus said, no man knows the hour of the day. He did not say that no man knows the year. Just putting that out there. Now, please, as I said, many people have been wrong. I don't want you to going away and say, you know, Pastor Peter says Jesus coming back in 2021. I'd be pretty spectacular if he did. It's the greatest event on the planet. No two ways about that. And the year's ticking by, as I said. People have been wrong before and they'll cry wolf and they'll write another book and all that. All I'm saying is we live in interesting times. We need to wake up and be strengthened, right? So the Antichrist, the Antichrist, the mark of the beast. Who is he? When is it? When's it going to happen? What happens to those who take it? The Antichrist, I want to read about it. It's written about in Daniel. He's written about in Daniel. He's written about in the book of Revelation. Let's read the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea. I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. All these obviously um, represent nations, represent things. And so, you know, we'll get into a little bit, but the dragon gave him his power. And uh, of course, the dragon of old is a devil, his throne and great authority. He offered to Jesus, now he's offering it to the Antichrist. And I saw one of his heads as if being mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And some would say this Antichrist gets assassinated and comes back to life. Some say he gets shot. Some say he gets strangled. Some say he gets his throat cut. Um, some say that's not actually what, what it means and what happens. You can hear all kinds of theories and all kinds of things. But all the world marveled and followed the beast. They worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. They worshipped the beast. You've got to remember the false prophets here as well. Uh, saying, who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemous. He's a very boastful person. He was given authority to continue for 42 months, three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. He was granted and he's granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names are not being written in the book of life. That's the most important thing right there, friend. Get your name written in the book of life. Hallelujah. Give your life to Jesus. Of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I just love the scriptures. Verse 9, if anyone has a hear, uh, ear to hear, let him hear. Remember, that's what Jesus said to the seven churches. Who's got an ear to hear? Let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed by the sword. You've got you to think about who kills people by the sword because the saints actually get beheaded. And so think about that. Who, who actually beheads people in the world today? Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, spoke like a dragon. He exercised all authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast who had the deadly wound and was healed. He performs great signs so that even makes fire come down out of heaven on the earth in the sight of men. You know, it's a false deal right here because it was what, of course, Elijah did. He deceives those who dwell on the earth and those signs which he granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who has wounded by the sword and lived. Remember the image of also Nebuchadnezzar, the 666, made of gold. I've talked about it. The issue is worship. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship. 
worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich, poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their hand or on their forehead, and that no one may buy or sell except who has a mark of the name of the beast or the number of the name. A lot of people are asking me, is this vaccine the mark of the beast? I'm going to be answering it. I'm holding a special meeting on August the 11th in the church, special meeting, a midweek meeting, and I'm going to be talking about, is the vaccine the mark of the beast? Is it ethical for Christians to take the vaccine uh, if, if it's got um, uh, aborted fetuses and using to manufacture or using in, in the build-up to it? Uh, I'm going to be talking about some things because the truth sets people free. And so we need to know. Here is wisdom. Let him understand and calculate the number of the beast for the number. For it is the number of man. His number is 666. Uh, this is probably one of the most well-known things in the Bible. You talk to people out everywhere on the street. Um, even if they haven't heard of Jesus, they've heard of 666, right? But six is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. Seven is a number of completeness. It's associated with the divine. Six is an incomplete number. Three sixes, 666, are inherently incomplete. In Christian numerology, and of course that's a, a whole religion in itself and it doesn't pay to delve in there too much because this is where people go off off the rails. It's like truth in, in, um, in, in, the, in the stars and the heavens and people get into horoscopes. There's an element of truth there, but we're told not to dive into that. But the number 888 represents Jesus, the Redeemer. Eight is the number of resurrection. And so the number of the Trinity is 777. So using Greek and Hebrew numerology, every letter has a numeric value. So when John was writing the book of Revelation and wrote down 666 here, Nero, who I mentioned before, Nero Caesar, that great terrible persecutor of the church, his name in Hebrew and in Aramaic added up to the numerical value of 666. They say that John wrote 666 as a code to hide the fact instead of writing Nero's name there because he would have been killed for that. Now, all the early church fathers preached that the Antichrist was Nero. In fact, three uh, early church fathers, and I'll give you their names, and they've all got big names, Victor, Nor Victor Reninus, Lacta, uh, I should give up right now, Lactitanius and Servius all thought Nero would come back from the grave, from, from, from hell, and be the embodiment of the future Antichrist. Now, if you Google Wikipedia, and uh, I'm not saying this, but Wikipedia says this, uh, according to Wikipedia, Muhammad's name adds up to 666. There's been a number over the years, even in recent times. I remember back in the 70s, we all thought Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist because his name added up to 666. You can make numbers say a lot of things. Interesting enough, the oldest manuscript of the book of Revelation called the Piperus 115 has not the number 666, but it has the number 616. Now, Hitler, his number was 616. That's interesting, isn't it? But let me assure you, that 666 is not the only clue of the Antichrist. We're going to look at a couple of other clues. If we are in the very last days, then it means that the Antichrist is living on earth right now. So who is he? Even though we're going to look at it, but we do need to be more focused. And I believe we need to know more and be more um, putting our attention on the great, wonderful event after the three and a half years when Jesus returns, when he touches down and the mount that he's going to touched down on. The Bible says that that mountain splits and, and one of the prophets of old says that that mountain splits and they say there's a gigantic fault line running right through that mount where his foot touches down, ready to be opened up. And so this is, and of course, you know, he, he rides through that gate um, and I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to tell you all this, but you know, that gate has been sealed up uh, for 2,000 years waiting for the Messiah to ride through it. I've got photos of that gate. And uh, so in any case, this is where every eye will see him. And this is where the Antichrist and the beast and the false prophet and all this are thrown into the lake of fire, Revelation 19.20. And the devil's chained up, praise God, but he's only chained up for 1,000 years while Christ and the saints rule on the earth. And although we don't know why and we can't quite understand, well, we're, we're told why, but we don't quite understand why the devil is released for a short time after that thousand years. And, uh, but he is ultimately thrown into the lake of fire, Revelation 
chapter 20. All the dead are raised. The great white throne judgment begins where everyone comes before God to give an account. Jesus said in Revelation 20, listen now, blessed are those who take part in the first resurrection. These are the saints who were raised to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Wow. And as mentioned, the second resurrection is at the end of the thousand year reign when all the dead, other dead people are raised for the great white throne judgment. Let's just read over before we get back to the Antichrist because this is, to me, this is very, really where we need to be focused on. Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, the small, the great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is a book of life. We're going to be talking about the books in time to come. And the dead were judged according to their works and by the things that were written in the books. Not just one book, but books. So what else do we know about the Antichrist, apart from forcing everyone to take a mark if you don't worship him and so forth? He begins as a man of peace, but he's boastful and arrogant. He's got an amazing energy. He'll make war with many people. In fact, five times in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 7, 12, verse 17, 13, verse 4, and 7, and 17, verse 14. If you're doing study, he's making war with people. He will have temporary defeat, but will come back stronger. Revelation 13, verse 12 and 13. He will invade Jerusalem, Revelation 12. 13. He'll be strong in the south and in the east and in Israel in Daniel chapter 8, verse 9, talking about Syria and, and Assyria, uh, sorry, Assyria, but today Syria and Babylon, Iraq, and so forth. Many people, many people, I, you know, you study what people say about this good. Date, I'm a, I'm a, I love the Dakes Bible, uh, Perry Stone, others, you know, you got so many people uh, see the Antichrist as a Muslim arising. That may be a surprise to you. What else may be a surprise to you is that many see him as one who rules over these 10 kingdoms, these 10 horns. And so where we think he's going to rule over the whole world, like here in New Zealand, forcing everybody to take a mark, that may not happen. He may only have authority. The Bible says he rules over the whole, all the world. But you know, the Bible also says, for example, Nebuchadnezzar, ruled over the whole world, but he ruled over the world of that time. And so the thing is, is that sometimes it's like a figure of speech. Now he may rule over everybody, maybe in Africa, uh, maybe, you know, in, in, in Tonga, you know, all these little islands, but that is not necessarily the case. And a lot of Bible scholars and good Bible scholars say he only rules over that Middle East area and over Europe. Now, interesting, you know, the 10, there was 10 nations. I remember Barry Smith getting so excited when the 10th, per, 10th nation joined the common market. Uh, but that number has come and gone a little bit. And we've got, now we've got Brexit and different things like that. But let me just give you this thought. Europe devise, derives from the word Europia. Europia. It's a Greek legend where Zeus, Jupiter, who was considered to be the father of gods, disguised himself as a bull after seeing a female named Europia. He took her to the beach and raped her and it resulted in a son, a son by the name of Minos. Now in mythology, Europia was considered a female goddess that rode the bull who had large crescent horns, you know, like the devil's horns. In fact, today in front of the European Union Parliament building in Brussels, talking about the resurrection of old gods, there's a large bronze statue of Europia holding the horns of the bull, to be Zeus. And so some say that the Antichrist rules uh, Europia, Europe over there, and, and also the Middle East section, and that is ruling over all that world. And, and uh, so, as I said, I'm not here necessarily to say, you know, adamantly this, adamantly that, uh, because there's so much to this. There's so many people have got so many thoughts about it more intelligent people than me, I have to confess. And so I'm just giving you some, some different thoughts, some different theories of what may or may not be. I know what the book says, and so we can take heart from that. But as I said, you know, will he rule in Fiji? Will he rule in, um, you know, other nations that are far off? It doesn't necessarily say that. So the beast described in the book, the leopard, the bear, the lion, the dragon have all been interpreted and all been different, different interpretations, but we're pretty clear that obviously uh, some of these nations are clear and we can talk about the, the uh, Nebuchadnezzar's image and we've mentioned that before, but they've all got significance and a number of interpretations too, and some have come, some have gone, but it's interesting, apart from 
possibly being the unwalled nation, America, who's a global power today, is not mentioned in the end time prophecy. Maybe it goes into civil war, and I don't know, but maybe it's not ruled over by the Antichrist. Apart from the scriptures talking about Israel being carried home on the wings of an eagle. And many American planes, they were mainly used to, uh, to bring, and of course they've got the eagle emblem on their wings, uh, transported thousands of Jewish people back to the homeland, fulfilling scripture. So I'm going to conclude regarding the Antichrist, because remember he's given power by the false prophet. And so it's like political and, and uh, religion working together. And we also need to look, and please, nobody has a full scoop, inside scoop on how it goes in every de detail, but I will next week give you some more figures. Some give you, you know, interesting, I was just reading that gold, and I looked it up, gold heats at, because we try it as gold in the fire, right? Gold heats at the temperature of 948 Celsius, 948, 1948, interesting. I did see on a couple of other sites, it's 1946 that it heats, 946, but most say 1948. Interesting. But I'll just give you this thought. I mentioned in Daniel 7.25 that the Antichrist, he will intend to change the appointed times. Remember the caterpillars I did, the, the seven, uh, seven years of creation, 7,000, seven years of restoration, 7,000. Remember six day man was created, the seventh day God rested, six days you shall work, seventh day you rested and so forth. Talking about the millennial reign, the seventh day of rest and so forth. 6,000 years of creation and, 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 and so forth, right? Listen now, the Jews, and I mentioned this when I was doing that, that message, the Jews have the year 2021, they have the year in their timetable as 5,781. And I could never figure why, if we're around the year 6,000, I do believe that God's a God of precise, and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't 6,000 years that Jews would have that. Well, apparently they have not calculated the year from Scripture, but from ancient rabbinic writings called the Cedar Alam, the Cedar Alam. That's where they get the 5,781. And that records the Persian period that only lasted 34 years. They record it to have only lasted 34 years where history tells us that it lasted 185 years from 516 BC to 331 BC, 150 years. And when you add up the discrepancy, as some people have done, some great scholars have done, and I was looking this all this up, add up the discrepancy, they're actually out by 220 years. So according to their calendar, if you added it up and put it right, we're actually in 6001, 6001. They say they did that to hide the time of the Messiah's birth prophesied in Daniel because he prophesies about Jesus' birth and he prophesies about, obviously, the second coming. Three scholars add up biblically to put us around the 6,000-year mark. Some 6,002, some 590, sort of thing, but, and one 6,000. So the Feast of Tabernacles in Exodus 34, 22, and I close, observe it at the end of the year. And, uh, you know, I'm a big believer on the Day of Atonement. I'm a big believer in that. And so I'm looking forward to sharing. I'll share a little bit more about some numbers next week. I know numbers can bamboozle people. I know some people aren't, aren't interested in numbers. Some people go, wow, wow. You know, so the thing is I want to share a little bit more, a little bit more on the Antichrist, and then we're going to be moving along in the book of Revelation. I hope you're enjoying the return series. I'm enjoying studying it. I'm learning some stuff and gaining some stuff and understanding some stuff. And as I said, it's all going to pan out. Just remember the big block. Jesus is coming back again. Hallelujah. He loves you and he's got the best for you. So let's just give our all to Christ. Let's wake up and be strengthened. And uh, as the Bible says, as Jesus said, let's, let's, let's be eagerly looking. Let's be in prayer. God bless you. Thanks for listening to Return Part 9.